I'm joined by four amazing panelists. Uh, they're connected with SNCC and the NAACP, and they're ready to talk about their work during the civil rights movement and also afterwards and today. Uh, so first, I'd love to share their bios with you, and then I'm gonna turn this over to them so they can share their prepared remarks with all of us. Cool. Um, okay, awesome, and then there will be um, time for questions and a conversation afterwards. Um, so we'll have a bit of an open dialogue. Uh, so we can start with the bios. Um, next to me is Charlie Kopp. He was born in Washington, D.C. in 1943. He's a founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists. Kopp began his career in 1974 as a reporter for WHUR Radio in Washington, D.C. In 76, he joined the staff of National Public Radio as a foreign affairs reporter. He was an on-air writer, correspondent for PBS's Frontline from 1980 to 1984. And from 85 to 97, Cobb was a member of the editorial staff of National Geographic magazine, the first black writer to become one of the magazine's staff writers. Um, on July 24, 2008, the National Association of Black Journalists honored Cobb's work by inducting him into their Hall of Fame. Cobb is a co-author with the legendary civil rights organizer and educator, Robert P. Moses, of the book Radical Equations, Civil Rights from Mississippi to the Algebra Project. He co-edited No Easy Victories, African Liberation and American Activists Over Half a Century, 1950 to 2000, with William Minter and Gail Hovey. His book On the Road to Freedom, A Guided Tour of the Civil Rights Trail, was published in 2008. And his latest book is This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, how guns made the civil rights um, possible. And um, he's also uh, recently a recipient of a very prestigious award, uh, the Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Yes, so <laughs> congratulations. <Thank you. laughs> and then uh, we have Bernard Simulton. Uh, he was born in Tiplersville, Mississippi, and attended college at Mississippi Valley State University, graduated with a BS in um, sociology in 1976, and then he went on to receive his master's in public administration from the University of North Dakota in 1981. While at Valley, he was commissioned a second lieutenant, or lieutenant sorry, in the United States Air Force and served honorably for 23 years, retiring in 2000 as a lieutenant colonel. While in the Air Force, he served in several leadership positions, such as Missileer, Flight Commander, Squadron Commander, and Professor of Aerospace Studies. Uh, during his tour of duty at the Defense Nuclear Agency in Alexandria, Virginia, he was selected for a special assignment to serve on the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty Negotiation Team in Geneva, Switzerland. He received numerous military awards while serving on active duty, including the Defense Meritorious Service Medal. He is a life member of the NAACP and has served as the president of the Alabama State Conference of the NAACP since 2009. Since joining the NAACP in Alabama, he has twice received the Regional Medgard Evers Award for Leadership and received recognition from the Alabama State Conference for Outstanding Leadership of a Branch. And then we have Cortland Cox. Uh, Cortland Cox was a SNCC organizer for the Freedom Summer Project in Mississippi in 1964. He worked in LaFleur County to register African-American Mississippians to vote and become a part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. In 1996, or sorry, in 1966, Mr. Cox served as a SNCC representative to Bertrand Russell Tribunal on the Vietnam War. Also participating on this tribunal was Jean Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and Isaac Dorst. Mr. Cox and others from the Civil Rights Movement founded and managed the Drum and Spear Bookstore and Drum and Spear Press. Drum and Spear Press published a number of books, including works by C.L.R. James and children's books. Drum and Spear Press also had a children's radio program entitled Saya Woto. So, later, Cox served as the Secretary General of the Sixth Pan-African Congress in Tanzania. The Congress was an international meeting in Africa. Oh, an international meeting of African and Caribbean countries, African liberation movements, and African peoples from the United States, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Most recently, he has participated in organizing the SNCC Legacy Project, and he has served as the first president of its board of directors. And at the end, last but not least, we have uh, Jory Augusto. Jory Augusto is a Gerard Visiting Associate Professor of International and Public Affairs and Africana <coughs> Studies, as well as an associate, a faculty associate at Brown Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. As a Watson Fellow, uh, Augusto is currently part of the Watson's Brunel Initiative, 
and she has served on both the board of the SNCC Legacy Project and also on its editorial board, which has conceived and um, oversees the recently launched SNCC Digital Gateway. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, I think we'll start first with Charlie Cobb. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, see, I was a SNCC field secretary from 1962 to 1967, for the most part in Mississippi and in the Mississippi Delta, and I want to speak to you uh, from that experience. Uh, although I will discuss the freedom movement of the mid-1960s that I was involved with, and hopefully there will be time uh, uh, to also discuss its relevance and its connection to today's movement for black lives. I mainly want to reflect on the organizing tradition of the black freedom struggle and its impact on the 1960s, especially Mississippi, a tradition that goes back to the days of slavery in colonial and antebellum uh, America, because this is largely, in my view anyway, ignored by much of today's historiography, although a new generation of scholars may be changing this. And I want to bracket the idea of history from the inside out, which is how I think of it when I think of, of how one should approach history. Uh, I want to bracket this idea of, of approaching history from the inside out by first by quoting uh, two significant figures who were deeply involved uh, in the movement I was part of. One is Ella Baker who is really a legendary figure in 20th century uh, movements for social change, uh, and arguably the most influential grown-up on those of us who formed uh, SNCC. Uh, and secondly, I want to quote uh, from uh, Stoughton Lynn, who uh, currently is a historian and a lawyer in Youngstown, Ohio, but uh, was a big coordinator of the Freedom School program in Mississippi in 1964 when he was a history professor at Spelman College in at, at Atlanta. Uh, both of them played uh, significant roles with SNCC, and I hope uh, by using them and one of the advantages, since I'd much rather be at a keyboard than a microphone, having books is I can lean on books to find the words that I want. Uh, uh, hopefully, I, 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 by quoting them, I can make at least two things clear about history that I think we need to think about in approaching history differently. Um, so first, uh, uh, Ms. Baker. And this is uh, really uh, the, the two points I want to make about history. One is, is getting down an accurate record of what happened and what the thinking was beneath what happened. And secondly is history that's useful to people engaged in struggle for social change. So the first person I want you to listen to is Miss Baker, and she was Miss Baker to us, because while we were in our teens and early 20s, she was 57 years old when she made her way to us. Uh, this is Miss Baker speaking to us, and since we do have a representative from the NAACP here, a legendary figure in the NAACP's history too, because she was organizing. NAACP branches in the Deep South in the 1940s. And you have to fix your mind on a black woman in the 1940s crisscrossing the South, organizing NAACP chapters. Whatever SNCC went through, through doesn't come close to the kinds of risks that Ms. Baker was running uh, in, those, in those years. So this is Ms. Baker speaking to us about history. Uh, in order for us, she says, as poor and oppressed people to become a part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. That means we're going to have to learn to think 
in radical terms. I use the term radical in its original meaning, getting down to and understanding the root cause. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you change that system. That is easier said than done. But one of the things that has to be faced is in the process of wanting to change that system, how much have we got to do to find out who we are, where we have come from, and where we are going? I'm saying, as you must say too, that in order to see where we are going, we not only must remember where we have been, but we must understand where we have been. This is Ms. Baker speaking to us in 1967 bunch of young people uh, taking our first steps, really, uh, into the world. It's important, if you want to understand how I think about history, for you to hear Miss Baker, who I hear in my head all the time, every time I think about uh, history. Now, and I can come back to her. Now, Staunton, who I told you uh, was a Spelman professor and a historian uh, and the coordinator of the Freedom School, has a notion that he calls and I like to use it, particularly in academic uh, sessions, uh, sessions, because I've noticed in using his term uh, that it sometimes makes at least some academics a little bit uncomfortable. But he has this notion of what he calls guerrilla history, uh, as a reflection of, of, of his own dissatisfaction with the approach to history. This is what Staunton says about guerrilla history. In the, uh, in the practice of guerrilla history, the insights of non-academic protagonists are considered as potential to be potentially as valuable as those of the historian. Thus, guerrilla history is not a process wherein the poor and oppressed provide poignant facts and a radical academic interprets them. Historical agent and professor of history are understood to be co-workers, together mapping out the terrain traveled and the possibility of openings in the mountain ridges ahead. This is Staunton on guerrilla history, and that approach is reflected in what you'll see later on this morning in the SNCC digital gateway that those of us SNCC veterans now uh, uh, who, who form, in particular, the SNCC Legacy Project, have just launched after four years of collaboration uh, with uh, Duke University. Now, this being said, uh, this uh, context, if you will, being established, let me now outline three things that I think are essential to understand if you really want to understand and teach the freedom movement. And I should say, we use the term freedom movement more often than civil rights movement. And we saw the civil rights movement as a piece of the freedom movement. And one of the reasons for doing that is it doesn't lock us in to a particular time frame. You know, a particular time frame, you most often hear people talk about the civil rights era or the civil rights time and whatnot. Well, the freedom movement really has existed since the first Africans were, were offloaded on the first ships to a land on American soil and sold in, into slavery. And it's defined by centuries of struggle, you know, organized struggle. I, I like to tell when I, in the, on the occasions uh, when I do uh, talk to students, you know, if you think about it, uh, organized black struggle that goes back to the days of slavery did not involve protest marches on auction blocks. And it did not involve sit-ins at plantation manor dining room tables seeking a seat at the table. What was involved was organized effort to escape or to rebel or to sabotage, sometimes to assassinate, to disrupt in various ways. This is organized struggle that frames the entire history of black life in America. I'll spare you that history here. 
partly because we just don't have enough time. But there are three things I do want you to understand. First is that insofar as we're looking at the 1960s, the era that belongs to me and my generation, one of the significant things you see is a convergence of young people and I was 19 years old when I went to Mississippi in 1962. You see a convergence of young people with older people who were willing to share both their experiences and their networks that they had been developing in many, most instances, I would argue, before we were even born. This is part of Ms. Baker's story. Ms. Baker made her way to us in 1957 in, 19, in 1960, I'm sorry, when she was 57 years old, and what she did was open up networks that she had begun developing in the 1930s to us, and she also shared her experiences. This is where the idea of organizing at the grassroots was planted in our heads, because it was not in our heads before Miss Baker put it there with her various conversations. So that's the first thing I want you to understand. The second uh, point, uh, once we began working at the grassroots, we found uh, that people, we found people who essentially were prepared to raise their voices in ways in which they could not uh, be ignored. This is Ms. Fannie Lou Hamer's story. I was with her the first time she tried to register to vote. And she was just a, a woman. She, she really didn't stand out, but she, she was a woman from a plantation in Sunflower County, uh, Mississippi. But, but she emerged within, in the, first, because everybody was scared, you know. And Sunflower County was the birthplace of the White Citizens Council. And you had to go in those days to the county seat where the White Citizens Council was born, to the circuit clerk's office, to register to vote. And, and they quickly shut down the courthouse. And then as we uh, were getting ready to go back, 23 miles away where we had come from, this little town called Ruleville, Mississippi, the driver of the bus that had brought us there was arrested because we had come in an old school bus that was usually used to bring cotton workers uh, to the cotton fields, day workers. And he was arrested for driving a bus of the wrong color. Now you're stuck on a road with the driver under arrest and it's starting to get dark and you're exposed as people who are trying to register to vote. Now we, as young organizers had nothing to offer the people. We couldn't offer them protection or anything. We couldn't assure them of anything. From the back of the bus, this lady began singing, and it was Mrs. Hamer. And just through the power of her voice alone, she was able to shore up the bus. And the people on the bus elected a small delegation to go talk to the police to ask, okay, what, what, what can be done? How do we get out of here? And the policeman said uh, uh, the, the way to get out of there was to pay a fine of $100. And there were 18 people on the bus plus four of us from SNCC, and there wasn't $100 between us, <laughs> among us. So people collected the money, and as I recall, we had about $47. And so this same delegation goes back to the policeman and says, well, we just have $47. And if that's not enough to release the bus driver, then you might as well arrest us all. I mean, these are people we had brought, not us, black militants. No, these were the sharecroppers, and two of them were beauticians that we had brought. And it was an amazing thing for these people to tell this policeman, uh, well, you might as well arrest us if $47 is not enough. And they were able to do that, I argue, because Mrs. Hamer had shored them up enough with the power of her voice. And the policeman accepted the money. Now, I don't know that the money ever got to the Sunflower <laughs> County uh, <laughs> Treasury. <laughs> but... <laughs> 
I'm telling you this story to just to illustrate, you know, if you want to understand the movement, that's what you have to understand. And Ms. Hamer emerges out of this as one of the powerful leaders of Mississippi's movement. And the lesson in this is that leaders didn't create the movement, the movement created leaders. Leadership emerges from the movement that emerges. That's Mrs. Hamer's story, and that is any number of people like it cited Mississippi, Central Alabama, Southwest Georgia, and the like. Now, as the clock ticks, I have to give particular emphasis in making this point before moving to my last point, uh, that many of the people who are absolutely essential at this level of struggle, and I would argue this is where the power of the movement was, not in the mass protests led by charismatic leaders, which is not to diminish the importance of mass protests in public spaces. But the real power of the movement lay in these communities, such as the community that Mrs. Hamer lived in. And many of the people in these communities were NAACP leaders. You know, you didn't just parachute into these communities. We were introduced into these communities. And the people who most often introduced us were local NAACP leaders who, against odds, I can still barely imagine had organized these local branches in some of the most violent parts of the country. I'm thinking of E.W. Steptoe in uh, Amit County, Southwest Mississippi, was arguably the most Klan-ridden part of the state. And in 1952, E.W. was a dairy farmer. And he had gone to New Orleans to, to either sell or buy some cows. And that's where he heard about the NACP. He thought it was a good idea. And he comes back home and organizes an NACP chapter. It didn't take long for him to become a target. And one day during a NACP meeting on his farm, uh, the, the sheriff and a whole posse of white men come storming into the meeting and they seize the membership list. Well, as you can imagine, membership dropped in Amid County. Mr. Steptoe, and again, a 50 some odd year old man, uh, Mr. Steptoe bought enough NAACP memberships to have an official NAACP chapter in Amit County. I think he made up most of the names, but he sent the money to New York and had enough members to, to, to have an, an official. He wanted an official in Amit, because I asked him about this. He wanted an official NAACP branch, he said. So these stories, the whole history of struggle in the South is dotted with people like this, raising their voices in ways that you don't even expect, in places you certainly don't expect. E.W. Steptoe in Amit County, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer in Sunflower County, R.L. Strickland in, in Lowndes County, Alabama, Mama Dolly Rains in Southwest Georgia. I go on and on and on. Uh, uh, with these names. Uh, uh, and lastly, uh, the important thing, to, on the third point I want to make in, in terms of really understanding what unfolded in the 1960s has to do with challenge. If you really look at the movement, you'll see that as much as people challenged white supremacy and racism, uh, more importantly, I would argue, are the challenges that black people made to one another within the black community. Uh, people ask me all the time, a lot, when I'm talking about my experiences, and they say, well, how did you, a guy from Washington, D.C., wind up in Mississippi in 1962? Well. Like I was at Howard University, and, and like a lot of black students at those days, I was involved in the sit-in movement. Because I was involved in the sit-in movement, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, gave me a bus ticket to go to a workshop for young people in Houston, 
uh, Texas. They gave me money for a bus ticket, and I bought this bus ticket and it's from D.C., Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, uh, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and on into Texas. And I got off the bus in Jackson because uh, the students there were sitting in, and I felt it's one thing for me to be involved in sit-ins in Virginia and Maryland, but for students to be sitting in in Mississippi seem to me to be qualitatively different. In my way of thinking, I think it's true for everybody in my generation, certainly the guys, Mississippi was the worst place in the universe for a black person because that's where Emmett Till was murdered. So I couldn't get straight in my head how students could be sitting in there. So I made my way to the sit-in headquarters and told, I met some students there and I told them that I was on the way to this workshop. One of these students, uh, Lawrence Giot, who would later become, who was a Tougaloo College student then, but he would later become chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Great, a big guy, six feet, a couple hundred pounds. Uh, after I finished explaining what I was doing, I uh, got up from his seat and he hovered over me with complete disdain. And he tells me, I never, I, you remember words exactly in these situations. He says, you say you're going to Texas for a workshop on civil rights? What's the point of doing that when you're standing right here in Mississippi? <laughs> and then another one of these students, Jesse Harris, chimes in. He says, yeah, man, you're in the war zone here. <laughs> and I kind of got the message, you know, you could go off somewhere and chatter if you wanted to, but we're getting ready to do stuff here in Mississippi. And it was summertime, and, and, and I said, okay, I don't have to go to that workshop. And I began to hang out with these guys, and, and I didn't realize that once you did that, you couldn't at the end of the summer then tell all these people you are now involved with up in the Delta in my case. Well, it's been an interesting summer. Thank you very much. I gotta go register for classes. <laughs> so at least I'm not made up that way. So I uh, stayed as it turned out for four more years. But, uh, uh, and again, it's the challenge that's important to understand. If I had a lot of time, I could tell you what challenge Martin Luther King that led to his emergence as the leader of the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. And I could tell you about challenges that unfolded in other parts of the South. But I, I think uh, I probably have gone over my uh, few minutes, so uh, I'll just stop with that idea of challenge. And we can come back to it uh, later, because I think it's also particularly relevant to the movement that has begun emerging since the murder of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida in 2012 that has led to the movement uh, or the movement for black lives as, as I often refer to it as. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are you ready, Bernard? <laughs> Great. So back to Charlie. I'd like to say good morning to everyone, and certainly want to thank uh, all those who had uh, a part in putting this together, uh, Tony and all the uh, staff that uh, had anything to do with uh, inviting me here to be here. You know, growing up in Mississippi in the uh, 50s and 60s and picking cotton in cotton fields and, and doing those type things, you know, it never dawned on me that uh, a little boy from Mississippi would have an opportunity to come to a prestigious university like Brown to, uh, to give a lecture or give a talk or to sit on any kind of panel. So I am certainly humbled by this experience and will cherish it for many years to come. But as already been stated, uh, I served in the military, but I want to talk to you about the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. and. Uh, now, I lived through the uh, civil rights movement in Mississippi and where we went to um, uh, uh, colored restroom, drank out of colored water fountains, went to the colored section of the of restaurants, and uh, even my high school class, it wasn't a class trip, we went to a movie, and the white students sat downstairs and the black students sat upstairs to watch the same movie. 
And uh, a lot of people, you know, look at that and uh, hear that and don't believe it, but that's actually true. Those are things that actually happen uh, to me. But uh, despite those odds, you know, uh, things that were against me, uh, I appreciate my parents for instilling in me uh, a desire to want to do better, to uh, go further and, uh, and do all I can. And so I appreciate them. Uh, my mother was 93, she's still living today. And so she's uh, excited for me to be here as well. But all these experiences helped to shape who I am today. It helped shape who Bernard Simulton is. Uh, the NAACP has been fighting for human rights, civil rights, uh, social rights, uh, fighting against hatred and bigotry since it was formed in 1909. Now, the forerunner to the NAACP was the Niagara Movement, in which W.E.B. Du Bois was a, a founder member of uh, a Niagara Movement uh, in New York. And uh, it was a uh, all African-American organization, well, all black organization. And uh, because it did not get very much traction, it did not have the tentacles to reach out into the far portions of the country. You know, things in New York and that area would, you know, they were taking care of things there. So uh, uh, Mayor White Ovington, who uh, read about the uh, uh, race riots in uh, Springfield, Illinois, and had read about the many lynchings that were occurring across the country, she, and she was white, uh, she felt the need to form a organization to confront uh, combat these types of atrocities that were occurring. And so she reached out to W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, uh, to form another organization uh, that was called uh, the NAACP. And uh, the race riots in Springfield, Illinois occurred in 1908. And that really is the catalyst that uh, brought about all the, uh, brought about the NAACP because uh, Ms. Mary White Overton was just sick and tired of all these uh, discriminatory practice that was happening. And, uh, and so um, when they formed the NAACP, as I said earlier, it was uh, predominantly uh, a white uh, people that came up with the concept and idea. And a lot of people don't know that today. And they, when they see National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they think it's just for colored people, but I tell uh, people in Mississippi, you know, we help, I'm sorry, in Alabama, we help all races of people, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're white, you know, uh, whether you're uh, Asian or whatever, if your rights have been discriminated, you know, we will take a look at what you're doing and see if we can't help you. Now, a lot of people think the NAACP is all things to all people, but we are not. A lot of people think that the NAACP can speak and, and things happen. We are not like that, and uh, we have to fight for any kind of uh, justice and equality. We have to fight with the sheriff department. We have to fight with the city council. We have to fight with the mayor's office, just like you do. And but the name itself does carry uh, some weight. And um, uh, there was a study done a few years ago uh, talking about name recognition, and uh, the NAACP was, I think, somewhere in the top 15 or 20. You know, name that people recognize when they, you know, if you just throw it out there, you know, and, and say, do you recognize what this is? It was in, I think, the top, certainly top 20, I think. And uh, so the, the name has recognition, and uh, there's certainly a lot of history behind that. Um, as I said, the NAACP was founded because of the uh, uh, violence that uh, was perpetrated throughout the uh, uh, country. And, and if I can get Maya to uh, put up a, uh, a, a film that I want you to show. Uh, the NAACP was outlawed in Alabama from 1957 to about 1963. The Attorney General thought it was a, uh, well, not, didn't think, but they accused us of being a, ter a terrorist organization, a, a communist organization, and so they outlawed us for many years and a lot of things were done on the, on, the, on the ground. Uh, a lot of the work that we, we did during that time frame was, uh, uh, was not recognized uh, because if you uh, had 
any association with the organization, you could not only lose your job, but you could be uh, prosecuted uh, as well. And so, are you ready? Okay. Why don't you take a look at this uh, ad campaign ad by our governor? Up in Washington, they always know better. Politically correct nonsense, I say. When special interests wanted to tear down our historical monuments, I said no and signed a law to protect them. We can't change or erase our history, but here in Alabama, we know something Washington doesn't. To get where we're going means understanding where we've been. Alabama is working again. Kay Ivey for governor. <laughs> Got your vote, okay. Well, uh, that ad, uh, it, it hurt a lot of people, uh, special people in the African-American community. She starts out by throwing up a uh, memorial that's in Selma, Alabama of blacks and uh, talking about it as a part of the uh, Preservation Act, Memorial Preservation Act. Well, we don't buy that and uh, the only reason she put that in there is to justify her uh, really trying to um, uh, get more people to some support her uh, by saying that we're trying to take away and, and do away with the monuments and uh, uh, Confederate flags and stuff in the state of Alabama, which we are. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, for her to use that as a campaign ad, it really infuriates uh, uh, people, and we have uh, protested it, and we have, uh, you know, had press conference and written articles about how she's uh, uh, misusing that. Now, the Memorial Preservation Act was was signed in uh, 2017 by her. Uh, the previous governor, Robert Bentley, uh, it was debated in uh, in the legislature, but uh, she took over. Uh, I think this was about April time frame and the legislature uh, came in uh, passed the bill in June and she signed it shortly after that. But this to me uh, shows you a good example of the thinking of the leadership in the state of Alabama. They want to preserve the, the all these monuments and I, I, want them, I want them preserved too, but I want them in some kind of museum out of public view, off of public property, and even off of private property, but that's, you know, we, you can do what you want to on private property. If you're driven down from um, between Birmingham and Montgomery, just before you get into Montgomery on the right side of the road there, there's a humongous Confederate flag that flies you know, day in and day out. And they've got it on private property, and so you know there have been protests against that. But you know it's on private property, so it's not much that we can do. Now, what caused the Preservation Act is uh, Senator Hank Sander, one of our state senators. He had uh, proposed a bill that would uh, change the name of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and of course Edmund Pettus is the uh, bridge in Selma where Bloody Sunday occurred. Occurred, and uh, so. He wanted to change the name. Uh, and the NAACP, we thought about it and thought about it. And uh, uh, now personally, I opposed the name changing because, you know, I wanted it to stay what it was. That's, you know, because people need to remember and know what happened. But anyway, the organization overall, we came to an agreement and we supported Senator Sanders' uh, effort to uh, get the name changed. But shortly after that, they came up with this Memorial Preservation Act that's no uh, monument, uh, no uh, uh, school can be changed, or nothing can be uh, changed, a street, anything, without going through this commission that they've set up to review this. And it's uh, uh, predominantly white uh, Republicans and uh, in, in whether well, Republican or Democrat really doesn't matter, but the, uh, uh, it's designed to keep these uh, monuments and statues in place. Now, in 2015, when the South Carolina state uh, decided to take down their Confederate flag, 
Uh, the NAACP and other organizations had fought that for many, many years, had called a boycott, uh, caused many organizations to not have their meetings there. Matter of fact, the state NAACP would not even hold its, uh, its state annual meeting there. They would go to another state to hold their meetings. So they had encouraged other organizations to pull out as well. And so, uh, so when that happened, our governor then with Bentley, he took down the Confederate flags that was around the Capitol there in Montgomery, Alabama. And, uh, and of course, you can imagine that, uh, 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 that he received a lot of uh, flack, a lot of feedback from whites who said, you know, you're not going to take our Confederate flag down. And they researched to see if he had the authority to do it. And yes, the governor had the, had the authority. Now he cannot do that. Uh, or she cannot do that anymore because of this Memorial Preservation Act they put in place. But at that time, the uh, uh, we supported that, and we thought Alabama, uh, you know, we thought that was a great thing for the governor to do to take down. It showed that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, moving forward to try and bring everybody together, rather than this divisiveness that we're seeing uh, uh, today. But uh, there was protests, and like I said, many, many white uh, groups, uh, they protested and marched on the Capitol with their Confederate flags. And, uh, but they're still down, and uh, we applauded uh, Governor Bentley for that. Uh, many folks, mainly white Southerners, uh, will say that the Confederate flag um, is not a symbol of racism or hatred, but merely symbolizes Southern heritage. Well, uh, they are absolutely wrong because the Confederate flag, uh, any time you see um, a, a protest, uh, you see, uh, the, along with the KKK, you will see uh, the Confederate flag. And all those symbols symbolize the hatred. And, um, and, and I've told several people that, you know, if, if I'm going to a place in, uh, you know, uh, especially if it's a private residence and they have a Confederate flag flying, you know, it makes me think twice whether I want to go there or not, you know, because I don't know what attitude they're going to come out with, or uh, if they're going to come out and shake my hand or come out and, and put, a, you know, put a gun in my face. And so I, I more than likely will stay away from that place. And we, uh, the NAACP, uh, had an opportunity to represent a young lady who, uh, in Prattville, who, uh, I mean, she was very bold. She went to her neighbor's uh, house and ripped his uh, Confederate flag down. Now, she was arrested, and she didn't mind being arrested and because uh, there was plenty of opportunity for her to leave. And uh, they threw the case out. She had uh, a good attorney who, uh, they arrested her for trespassing and uh, uh, destruction of property. And uh, they threw those cases out but she wanted to go the next day to do it again. And of course, we kind of <laughs> talked out of it and said, the judge may not be favorable at the next time. But, and, and she was a white lady, and, uh, but she was just sick of every day her child and the black children that lived in that neighborhood having to pass and see that Confederate flag waving. So, you know, it's not just African Americans or blacks that uh, see this as a hate symbol of hate. It, it's a lot of uh, white uh, see that as well. Um, I have traveled all over, you know, Germany when I was in the Air Force, and what I tell people is, you know, the swastika, you know, I never saw those symbols flying, you know, across the country of Germany. You know, if you saw those, they were relegated to a museum or something like that, where they should be. And you want to preserve the history, put it in a museum, but not out in public view where every day that, uh, it, case of Germany, a Jewish person would pass by that is remembrance of the Holocaust. And that's not what we want. And every time I see a Confederate flag, certainly it, uh, it reminds me of uh, what my ancestors faced in, in slavery. Um, the uh, NAACP continues to uh, protest uh, the flying of the Confederate flag. Uh, again, on, on private property as well as um, uh, public places. And uh, if you want to create a memorial uh, to the Confederate, um, 
that does not set well with most African Americans and who know the history of the Confederacy and what it stood for. And, um, and it, it stood for the preservation of the South, which meant that uh, blacks would have remained in slavery many, many more years than he did. Uh, we believe that America should be working to heal the vestiges of racism. And one method to do this is to talk about racism. Uh, we sent a letter to our governor, the current governor, Kay Ivey, to ask her to just sit down and talk about forming some kind of commission as they did in, in uh, Virginia to look at the issue of race and study the issue of race in the state of Alabama. And she did not respond to our requests uh, and it met a big brick wall. And that's causing a lot of problems because people don't want to talk about it. They think it's just going to magically go away. But almost at least once a week, we get calls from, we being the NAACP, get calls from uh, parents or students who are saying that you know, students are uh, being called the N-words and that uh, uh, we have one school that we're working with now where the teachers, after the students called them N-word and threw stuff on them, told the, the students to just avoid those that were doing these things to them. Rather than take affirmative action to, uh, to against the uh, young men that were doing it, and they were, these was, uh, upperclassmen, young white uh, male students, and they were young black, uh, uh, they were freshmen, uh, female students that they were doing this to. And uh, it's a predominantly rural school and uh, predominantly white rural school. And so there's some education that has to take place. And people have to feel that, you know, we've got to move beyond, uh, uh, you know, this the business where we are to working together to achieve uh, equality for all people. And uh, just a couple of minutes and I'll be finished. If, if you remember in 2008 when President Obama took office, uh, there were, there was a, actually a backlash against him uh, taking office. We received an increase in the number of complaints about racism in, uh, from people out in the community. We received one complaint from a young man who was arrested, and he said the uh, police officer told him that uh, Obama may be the president of the United States, but we are the law around here. And, you know, and of course, everybody know that the police, what they're responsible for, but he was saying that to this young black man, white officer, and to let him know that he didn't care about, you know, the uh, bus up, uh, that we had a black president that you know, they were still the law in, uh, and this occurred in Limestone County. I propose the following steps to of those in Virginia and create a commission to study race and the issue of race and, um, and we can create memorials uh, for racial justice. But until we as a nation rid our mind of this issue of racism, we will always be a nation of black and white and our racial inequality. And I thank you and I look forward to any questions that you may have for me. Thank you very much. Once again, uh, good morning. Um, when I looked at the topic for this morning's discussion, uh, the NAACP and SNCC, I assume that what was being asked was looking at the oldest and the youngest, looking at comparative kinds of discussions, and also looking at probably the more conservative and the more radical. And so I think when we look at the relationship between the NAACP and SNCC, things operated at two levels. Uh, Charlie talked about the first level, the level of cooperation, the importance of Ms. Baker to who was the director of branches, uh, to her importance to the founding and the philosophy of SNCC. 
uh, the importance of Medgar Evers and Aaron Henry, Vernon Dammer, E.W. Steptoe, and others. So that when SNCC and the NAACP were in the situation trying to deal with the questions that were life and death, then the issue was a great deal of cooperation. And there was probably not much or no daylight between the NAACP and SNCC. And Charlie spoke about that this morning. So what I will go to is the other extreme, where there was uh, competition between the NAACP and SNCC. And most of that competition did not exist in the field. It existed at the levels where the discussion was about money, where the discussion existed outside of the South in a lot of ways, and a lot of it in New York. So what I'll do is give you a couple of examples and some discussion, particularly around my experiences at the March on Washington. Uh, I served as the SNCC representative to the March on Washington. So I was involved in a number of meetings and a number of discussions uh, at that time. And the first example of competition that I got, and I was, I was a little older than Charlie. I, I was at that point uh, 22 years old. Um, so Roy Wilkins said to me, you know, when he's discussing the sit-ins, you know, I'm not going to let you young people come in here and mess up all that we've worked for all these years. His idea was that they had proceeded and did all this work through the courts. They had an orderly process. And here we are sitting in and freedom rides, costing them money and costing them disjointed relationships with their money sources. And he said to me, you know, I'm not going to let you young people do this and you'll have to do that over my dead body. And I looked at him and said to him, you know, that could be arranged. Um, the second example of competition is in 1963, I mean, uh, some of, most people, most people in here were not born in 63, so I just won't make these assumptions that you remember. Uh, but in 1963, there were, the, the SCLC and, in Birmingham had the Young People's Campaign. And these kids were you know, fire hose, they brought dogs um, on them. Bull Connor was, you know, decide, he was basically decided that at the end of the day, he was going to shut this down, the, the freedom movement down, the civil rights movement. And so one of the things I worked on, the, my responsibility to March on Washington was to help raise money and help bring support to get support to bring a number of the young people and people from the movement in, in the South to Washington for the March on Washington. So I thought and we agreed that we would try to get a freedom train, get a train that would come to the South and bring people to Washington. The idea was a, a great idea and so forth. Uh, however, I must say, and I'm sorry I didn't have, I, did, I tried to look for it. I thought we had it on our website. We could get no support from the major organizations for that. And I wrote Stokely Carmichael, who was my good friend, a letter. And I mean, I told him that either the NAACP or the SCLC would support this uh, effort to bring the people, in fact, to Charlie. It's Charlie's second point was that the movement, the energy of the movement are the people who are involved. And the, we could get no support 
for those people who were involved to bring them to Washington to the March on Washington. I mean, from the South to the March on Washington, because the, the established leadership thought that the cost was too much and the resources were not well spent. So I wrote Stokely and I quoted Billy Holiday. And I said to him, mama may have, and papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. Because at the end of the day, that while, you know, the, when, it, when you're looking at the struggle, that in a lot of ways, when it comes to the competition and when the discussion is about money, it becomes a very ugly kind of discussion. I want to go on to a third point about the March on Washington. At the beginning, the Kennedys were very much afraid. President Kennedy was very much afraid of the March on Washington and wanted to try to get it stopped. A. Philip Randolph, Biden Rustin, and others decided that, in fact, this was something that they tried to do in 1941, and they were not going to back down now. They backed down uh, in 41 when Roosevelt asked them to do it. And in fact, uh, as part of that discussion, you know, there was desegregation of the armed forces, but they were not going to do it now. So as the march went on, the organization for the march went on, it was clear that the kind of violence and other kinds of disruptions that people thought would happen was probably not going to happen. However, I must say that uh, Bobby Kennedy had all the National Guards and the military outside of Washington well prepared to come into Washington. However, the later, as the, as the discussion of the march went on, and it seemed that the march was going to be a big deal, Kennedy sent word through Roy Wilkins that he wanted to speak at the march in Washington. Byron Rustin, who was the organizer of the march, knew that would be a disaster. Because if Kennedy spoke at the March on Washington, it would be Kennedy's March on Washington, and not the March on Washington for the African American community. So what happened was I was walking down. We were going down to the restroom together. By it, in those days, people used to keep a little flask of gin or whiskey in their back pocket. So Bayer takes out a little sip of gin, and he takes it, and he says, this is a disaster. So he finishes going to the bathroom, and he comes back, and Bayer announces in the meeting that he heard that if Kennedy came to the march, that the black people would stone him. By it made it up from the bathroom <laughs> to back to the meeting. These people were totally nervous and scared of any concept of that would happen. And I, I, I said to, so that, that did not, that not fly. And the next thing that happened is then Kennedy said, he wanted the leadership to, in fact, meet with him first, and then take his message to the, to the march in Washington. Biden also blocked that, because his idea, again, was that Kennedy needed to hear what the people had to say, as opposed to the people having to hear what Kennedy had to say. Understanding 
who you are, where you're going, and what you're for is particularly important. The third, I mean, I guess the fourth, now it's the fourth example of this discussion about the NAACP and SNCC, came in 1964 after the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And the meeting, the, what happened in Atlantic City is that the Johnson administration knew that if the people in Mississippi, from Mississippi, the delegation from Mississippi were seated at the convention, it would be very disruptive to his campaign for president. So therefore, he used every tactic, and I don't want to go into all the tactics now, but I mean, they were literally threats. That is say, if you support this, your husband's up for a judgeship, you can forget it. I mean, basically, and, and they were. So what happened was they tried to get the people from Mississippi to accept a compromise as opposed to saying you could not be seated even though you played by the rules, even though you did everything that the Democratic Party said you should do and it to challenge the all-white Democratic, um, de Democratic delegation from Mississippi. They offer them two seats in the balcony and some other uh, nonsense. And, and I must say, there was a meeting in the church in Alabama, I mean, in, in, uh, New in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Every civil rights leader, every union leader, every liberal leader, tried to convince the people from Mississippi that it was in their best interest that they take a, comp a symbolic compromise of two seats in the balcony. And all of the discussion that came, and I'm including Martin King, I'm including Byard Rustin, I'm, I'm including um, um, Cl Adam Clayton Powell, I'm including Walter Ruther, I'm including all these people. And it was all about the money and the interests that would be disrupted if the people from Mississippi were not, be, not, were not stopped in their effort to move the discussion of freedom to challenge you know, the, the white supremacist delegation from Mississippi. So when the test came about whose interests will be served, whether it would be the interest of the Democratic Party and the moneyed interests, or the interests of the people in Mississippi, the, it was very clear that everyone who was supposed to be a representative of the people represented themselves. What happened was that after everybody spoke, then Ms. Hamer and the other people spoke from Mississippi, and they informed everyone that they didn't come up here for two seats. They came up here for a challenge, and they were not going to you know, go back with less. I must say to you that the establishment was absolutely livid that they were not able to control the situation. And after the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, went back to Mississippi, there was, I think, in uh, probably five or six months later, a meeting was called by the leadership, but in particular Gloucester Current, who was the director of uh, membership at that point. He had some, he was a very significant player. I'm not sure it was membership. 
And he tried to use his influence to make sure that the success of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the movement of people and acting on their own behalf never happened again. Because his view was that if they could not control it, and if the people, the moneyed interests could not control it, it should never happen again. I think that, you know, I mean, my sense is looking at from the history from the inside out is that when the focus is the work to be done and the movement that has to engage that to get, to get where we need to go with the people whose lives are really uh, impacted by the kind of segregation, the kind of exploitation that a lot of cooperation is, is possible. When there it is about money and when it is about competition, cooperation is no longer possible. One of the ironies uh, is an interest, very interesting ironies, is that Derek Johnson, who I believe is 49 years old, comes out of the Mississippi NAACP and is now the president of the NAACP, was greatly influenced not by what happened in New York, but what happened in Mississippi and the corporation of the people who tried to engage in struggle. So I see after all these 50 years that, that the end up, and, and when looking at what happened between the NAACP and SNCC is that at the start, the SNCC was greatly influenced by what happened in the NAACP. And today, the NAACP is greatly influenced, leadership of it, is greatly influenced by what happened in SNCC. I hope that continues that, that we are able to emphasize cooperation as opposed to competition. Thanks. I'm a little bit at a loss because I need Maya and she's not here. So what I'll do is start from here and hope that she comes in because it depends also on my showing you something. Can I pull it? Is it the website? Yeah. I'll, I'll try to see. Okay. You can start. So if you could imagine a 13-year-old girl sitting in a kitchen in Dayton, Ohio, listening at the edge at the doorway or while standing over the stove to exactly the same type of story and history that you just heard here, then you would know how I got into this and why I am at the table. My mother and father were in core and they were what was called friends of SNCC in northern cities. And it meant that our house was used as a place of R&R, rest and recreation, or maybe I should say rest and recovery, <laughs> from people who had been embattled in Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas. And that is where I think I was 13 when Charlie first came, and, I, you know, and a flow of people after that, Stokely and any number of people out. I was trying to remember if Kathleen Cleaver or not, but this is how they first got a hold of me. I say this to young people who are in the audience because they may get a hold of you. From there, I went to Howard University and I thought, okay, I can just be a student at the capstone of Negro education, not realizing that I was also stepping into a tradition, the same tradition that had begun some of the work of Charlie Cortland and many others. And before I knew it, I was taken off the campus, although I did graduate, <laughs> and taken to something called the Center for Black Education, and from there to Drum and Spear Press and Bookstore, and from there to the Sixth Pan-African Congress by my brother here. 
So 40 years later, it was not a surprise to me when I was asked to join the board of the SNCC Legacy Project. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about to finish off the, the panel's uh, contributions to the discussion, it'll be a little bit different because I'm not obviously going to talk about SNCC and the NAACP in Mississippi because you've heard that from those who were there and I wasn't. I'll try to bridge our discussions from yesterday and the rest of the day today. And I am aiming this, although I see a mixed bag in the room, at any young activists who are in the room now and are trying to think about history. Well, you could be an older activist too, but trying to think about history. Part of what the SNCC Legacy Board has is committees of work. Almost everyone on it, except for two of us, are actually veterans of SNCC. So that's the larger body. Then there's me, then there's Bob Moses' daughter, Maisha. We two are not. But we broke it into committees in 2010 when it was started after the uh, 50th anniversary at Shaw. And one of the committees was called, and still is, New Works, chaired by Charlie Cobb and myself. We didn't quite know when we started in 2010 what would New Works be. But one thing we wanted to be clear about was we wanted to construct a history that we could pass on, not pass on without criticism, but pass on to younger people who, like the people that you heard about, we consider to be subjects of history, not objects of academic study, subjects of history. And that what you do when you're engaged in activism, even if you're not thinking about it every day like that, is you are, as historical subjects, also creating historical knowledge. And it belongs to you even more than it belongs to the academy. So we've done a number of things, but one of the things that we did that um, is recently concluded and is very strategic for how we're trying to think about a history that can be used, a history that works, and a history that presents multiple voices from the inside out, in other words, from the people who were doing it, making it, is this thing called the SNCC Digital Gateway. I'm gonna keep it in the background, but I'm going to talk about the process for creating it. It took us four years. A lot of times when things are done digitally, it's like, there's the wonderful product, it's all finished, gee whiz, you can surf, you can Google, you can uh, search, you can do things. And it's kind of mysterious because it gets done by website designers and maybe by academics and maybe, if we're lucky, by archivists, trained archivists and librarians. But who's left out are the subject, the actual historical subjects and the makers of historical knowledge. So we wanted to create consciously, and that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process. We wanted to create consciously a history a work that would allow us to reach as large an audience as possible, but with particular audiences in mind, including young activists who ever since we started doing it have come to us over and over and they actually figure in particular parts on our page, but they wanted to know why did you do it and how did you do it? So we did this in partnership, as Charlie Cobb has mentioned, with Duke University, so archivists, some academic historians and librarians, but we consciously brought a particular style of work that we had to create as we went, but it's a style of work that was aimed at bringing to light the political, historical, and social, social knowledge that movements create. In other words, this is not just doing, but it's also thinking, but it's a thought that springs from action and then from reflecting on the action. Sometimes it's quick reflection before you do it. Sometimes it's reflecting on your feet as you do it and then sometimes it's reflecting afterwards. I like to think of, the, think of it as activists step in to the arena of struggle, they step back, and then they step in again, always differently because they would have learned. So we built, we had to build a working style. Anybody who is an activist develops at some point a kind of a mistrust of academics. It just, it's just like that, and there are many reasons why. We had to overcome that kind of mistrust to create a project like this one. I want to describe to you how we did some of it. I may have to go. So, we had to question 
the established historical lines, borders, categories, and hierarchies. In other words, we named what SNCC's actions were. We defined its precepts. We framed SNCC members and those with whom they worked as historical subjects. We thought afresh about how to punctuate or periodize history. Usually academics will write something and then they establish this is the period, this is the watershed moment, this is what you're gonna call the era. We decided we would do that work. We tried to unearth and to specify critical but less known spaces and less known terrains of struggle. So everybody knows Selma, but we didn't wanna stop with just Selma. Or everybody knows Freedom Summer, but we didn't wanna just stop with Freedom Summer. We thought consciously about who and what has been less audible and less visible, and we wanted to bring those in. We had to create a style of writing also that is somewhat different from academic writing about movement history or civil rights history. And for that, we kind of had an easy way in because Charlie Cobb and Judy Richardson, who is not here and should have, you know, might have been on the panel, have a style of writing that was honed actually in the movement. It was honed in independent black publishing. It was honed in movement journalism, as well as several genres of mainstream journalism. So the style of writing that you would see, you will see on the Sneak Digital Gateway, strays a bit, a lot, from the standard kind of academic style of writing a history. We also deviated willfully from a process, the academic process of peer review. That doesn't mean that everybody could just put up whatever they wanted, but what it meant was that we considered the right peers to do the review were other people in the movement. So we had an editorial board, but we also had the members of the SNCC Legacy Project, and then other people around the country that we could call up and ask. Of course we were aided by the archivists and by the librarians and by the academic historians, but I would say that our peer review process was actually peer review among the people who did the work. We also practiced with this our own brand of digital humanities. And it's not about big data or data mining or making sophisticated word counts. How many times did the word power come up in the document? Nothing like that. I think of it as we're putting, if you think of uh, anything that's computerized as a closed box after it's finished, you don't know what's in there or how it got there. We thought we're gonna put new actors. If this is a machine that is so important for 21st century life, we're gonna put new actors in it. So we worked with web designers, but we were the ones who said what will be, who will be the actors. We established a particular relationship with sources and places of provenance. So we had to find records, we had to find sites, we had to find collections, we had to wrestle with them, we had to cut, decide were we gonna link with those or were we not. And we were graced on this project always with something that is not often acknowledged, whether inside the academy or out of it, which is a whole lot of articulation work or invisible work that goes on to make offline and online work possible. Usually this is women who you see running in and out and up and down. Uh, sometimes it's younger people that you see, you know, kind of hanging on the edges. But without their invisible work that is often not recognized and named, it wouldn't have been possible to do this. The knowledge relations that we were creating with the people who were working on the project, whether it was the young students, whether it was the veteran activists, whether it was the librarians, also became social relations. And I think it's important to stress that knowledge relations are not some distant kind of thing. They're either equitable social relations or they're not, but they are also social relations. And in doing so, what we wanted to do, and we did it, was erase this long-standing traditional divide that says there are some people who are brave and courageous and halfway crazy, and they do wonderful stuff, and then there are other people who have the capacity to analyze and theorize what these people did. We wanted to break that down altogether. We also developed a notion, and this I think for younger activists is kind of difficult to do in the flow of the motion, but we're encouraging those with whom we're having a lot of intergenerational dialogue to think of it this way. We think of it as, as you are working, you are creating a retrievable history for yourself and of yourself and of your work. What, comes, what counts as a retrievable history? Images and sounds, all kinds. Minutes of the meeting, receipts of what you paid to get there on the bus on the airplane, the agenda that was set up, the bullet list that you quickly wrote down, the announcements about what you were gonna do, the banners, the signs, and the buttons. 
any platform or manifesto that you write up, not just the manifesto about what you were against, but also the manifesto or the platform about what you were for or what you are for. The side discussions, the back talk, the jottings down on the edge, the sketchings out, how we're gonna get from here to there, whether it's physically or in terms of the ideas. The way movement members frame themselves, the allies, and the opponents. How movement thinking travels and then gets reinterpreted and reconfigured and refashioned where it landed. And then something that I think of as just the roundness and the fullness of struggle life. What went on? It's about human beings. What were the relationships? What were the trials and tribulations? What were the joys and sorrows? If you leave that out, you're sucking out of what is a living history from the inside out, and it becomes some dry academic stuff on the page. And we particularly find that young activists want to know that. How did you take care of yourselves? Or maybe you didn't, and what happened? Um, what did you do in a moment of triumph, which is usually you had a party and you did that? They want to know all those kinds of things too. And the result, I think, is that what we created was a history, even though you can see, and I'll just show you a few things on the page. Um, is this the first page? I'm not very good at this. Let's see. Yeah, OK. okay. So you can, see that, you can see that this is the opening page. Everything you see running across the top was a discussion. These didn't just appear because the web designer put them there. It was a discussion. And you'll see that the categories aren't necessarily the categories that you would normally think of for a website. So we had long discussion about who people were, what they meant to the movement in the eyes of people who made the movement and did the work. So we settled after much discussion on SNCC staff, this was important, and if you click on it, you get to a whole list of people who were SNCC staff. I think I remember a discussion about what actually constitutes staff. They said if you ever got a voucher or something that would allow you to get on the bus or take a taxi, because most people didn't get paid, but SNCC staff. And then it was considered to be extremely important to talk about local people. And I think you can understand from Charlie and Cortland in particular why local people for us, in telling this history from the inside out, was very important. And you'll have names. I'm afraid to maneuver. I could go back and forth. I'll just do it in one. And then mentors and allies. And then you'll see a list of states down the side. And all of this is fairly open for us, but most of the states are from the south. But you'll notice Maryland, Cambridge, because an important set of actions took place in Cambridge. Um, let me see if I can get this down. OK, so I'm on the page that says, I was on the page <laughs> that said people. OK, I'm on the page that says people, right. And if you scroll down the list of names, you can see some of the names that, I can't do this, so I won't do it. If you scroll down the list of names, you'll see many of the people that uh, Charlie and Cortland mentioned. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm just going to say that this allowed us to create a nonlinear history. You can do it in a linear way because there's something called the timeline and it goes by time. But you can also do it geographically uh, by the, the places from the map. You can listen to actual people in the movement talking about their experiences to each other and separately in something called Our Voices. Uh, inside SNCC is a lot of inside SNCC. So one of the favorite things that younger people want to know is, how exactly did you organize? And organizing it is an important precept for thinking about SNCC, SNCC because, as Ella Baker said, strong people don't need strong leaders. So you find that people from SNCC do not often refer to leaders, at least in the way that we think of them, leaders of the movement. They think of themselves more as organizers, so the section on organizing is extremely important, we found in our intergenerational dialogues and conversations with young activists. And we, you know, we've been doing it more and more. So it means Black Lives Matter, Movement for Black Lives, Dream Defenders, also at one particular meeting, Dream Keepers, who are you know, the younger people involved in the immigration struggles. Um, more localized, but, but moving across the country movement. So we get, Everything and everybody, young, 
black and not only black activists who are interested. And one of the things they really want to know is how did you organize? Not because they're going to do it in the same way. The questions may be different, but it is a tradition. And one of our purposes as the SNCC Legacy Project is to pass on, not uncritically, but to pass on a living, valuable, black, radical tradition. If you want to know more about it, you can go to sneakdigital.org, and there you will find much, much more than what I will take my five minutes to have explained. <laughs> I want to do now what, uh, what the same people, everything that I am, I should say, was made by them and people in liberation movements. Very little of who I am or how I think was done by universities, and I think by now I've passed through several. So most of the things that are important to me about how to live, how to be, and why that I didn't learn from my parents, I learned from them. And one of the things that they taught me is, if you don't have more to say that's more important than whoever's talked, sit down, be quiet, <laughs> give thanks, and listen. <laughs> Um, thank you all so much for sharing with us. We have about 10 minutes left in the panel, so I think this would be a great time to open uh, the floor for Q&A. So there are two mics um, on either side of the aisle. If you could speak in, it will pick up uh, for the recording. Thank you all so much. It's a little overwhelming to think of a question, but I did want to go back to what Mr. Cobbett said about the challenges. And you said you might be able to get back to the challenges faced by Dr. King and others. So I wondered if you would take a few minutes to talk about that, please. I'll tell you one story. Like most journalists, I've got a whole pocket full of stories. So, and since you, I'll, let me talk about uh, how Martin Luther King emerged as uh, the head of the Montgomery Improvement Association uh, just before the Montgomery bus boycott uh, went into high gear. Uh, and the story, I should say, comes to me from a 95-year-old woman, Johnny Carr, who was one of the women active in the Montgomery bus boycott, who was one of Rosa Parks' people. And, and uh, some of you at least will know that uh, one of the big issues that Rosa Parks was involved in was the Reese Taylor rape in 1940, I forget, but she organized a whole set of women to fight against the rape of black women in, in Alabama. Uh, and a lot of those women will become key figures in the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. And Johnny Carr was one of them, so she's the one who's telling me this. And she says, you know, originally the Montgomery bus boycott was just to be a one-day boycott. Uh, and it was so successful that, that, that the black leadership, uh, largely ministers, preachers, met in Martin Luther King's church. He was the new minister in town, Dexter Avenue, Baptist Church to discuss extending the boycott until the city gave in and desegregated the, the uh, buses. And most of these preachers were afraid. And they were coming up with one excuse after the other as to why they sh maybe shouldn't do this right away. They should form a delegation and go down and have discussions with the bus company in the city. That, uh, uh, and it, anyway, they had were leery about doing this. And finally, the real leader of Montgomery, a man named Edie Nixon, who was one of A. Philip Randolph's people in the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, uh, and a former head of the Alabama NAACP, uh, as well as the Montgomery NAACP, stands up and essentially accuses the ministers of cowardice. And he, what he says, specifically according to Ms. Carr, is, quote, you preachers been eating these women's chicken long enough, fried chicken long enough, now it's time to get up off your behind and do something for them. And you see, it's the women who were riding the bus from one side of town to the other where they were the cooks and the maids and all of that and the babysitters who were facing the most hostility and 
uh, uh, in this whole system of segregation in Montgomery, Alabama, bus segregation in uh, Alabama. And at, after uh, E.D. Nixon made this accusation of cowardice, then a 26-year-old Martin Luther King, and very few people think of Martin Luther King as a 26-year-old, but a 26-year-old Martin Luther King then stands up and says, I am not a coward, uh, and embarrasses, essentially, the other ministers. And Martin Luther King is the young preacher in town. And they continue to meet, and they form, at that meeting in King's Church, the Montgomery Improvement Association. And they make Martin Luther King the head of it. And that's his first step. And they decide to continue the boycott. Actually, they have a second meeting that same night at Ralph Abernathy's church, where they actually uh, agree on a formal resolution uh, to continue the boycott. But this is Martin Luther King's first step in the national problem. So how should we understand this? You have to understand this as the kind of challenges that went on inside the black community, the kinds of challenges black people were making to one another to do something. It's the same kind of challenges is coming through to me as I'm watching the students sitting in in, in Greensboro and Nashville and Atlanta, what's coming through to me, and I'm watching it on television as a 12th grader. Well, Charlie, you're going to be in college next year. You're going to be right facing segregation next year. What are you going to do? Well, that's the challenge that was made by E.D. Nixon to those preachers and Martin Luther King. And I think that is plays a big role in what defines the freedom struggle of black people. And I'm sure it went on in the night. And that's really Harriet Tubman's story and Sojourner Truth's story. I mean, we could go all the way back to Nat Turner. And well, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> If you wouldn't mind going to one of the mics, if possible. I want to go back to the lack of trust among black uh, people. I think there is a lack of trust, but there is also a lack of loyalty among us. And I want to, I'm trying to become an organizer and, and maybe duplicate what happened in the 60s in this area for many reasons. I'm, I have a background in counseling and listening, so I have heard a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, not just in people of uh, black, but people of color in general. Um, and I think where we are is, is, is a good way for us to learn from you who are history. And my fear is that we may lose what we earn because I didn't know a lot of what you said. And to me, this room should be full of people trying to learn if we are all together for the fight. Um, so how do we get people nowadays where you got them back then? Um, that is, you know, one of the things that we recognize is age is relentless, uh, you know. And so one of the things that we try to do in this, in this website um, is to try to talk about our experiences. And I think particularly our voices, uh, where we, you find, you find um, discussions like this now that you can have um, you know, I think, you know, one of, one of the things, you know, that is really important, and I try to tell people all, that the thing that helps focuses, focus us is what is the work. I find that if the work is the discussion, then you don't have a lot of um, conflict because the work is so overwhelming. If other things, as I said earlier, money, you know, ego, position on the stage, all these things. So my sense is that I always try to find 
uh, an environment where work is the driving discussion. Because I think outside of that, there are too many influences that are negative. I'd like to add to that is you, you got to be intentionally about you, you, how you plan and how you go about being inclusive. Uh, and what I mean by that is you've got to include young people. It's no longer uh, the NAACP can't do it by itself. We need the support and help of the Latino community. We need the help and support of the LBGT community. And we've got to be inclusive if we're going to move forward in terms of social and human rights in this country. And we cannot remain in our little own kingdoms and think that, well, you know, uh, well, when NAACP is together, of course, we say we're the biggest, baddest, and boldest. But we know that we cannot do it by ourselves. And so we got to intentionally include young folks and intentionally include uh, other organizations along with us when we uh, are planning. It's nothing more than a demonstration, a march. We got to be intentionally inclusive. If I could add something that's, say sorry. If I can, can you? If I can add something that, um, that might be useful, the, the page that's here learning from experience, roots of organizing. But I think one of the lessons that comes through when, when Cortland is talking about focus it on the work is another thing that comes from out of SNCC's tradition, and it's also tradition of other black movements, which is you start with an analysis of what's going on, what are the questions, what are people worried about, what are they grappling with. In other words, you don't cite the beginnings of what you're going to do or your strategy based on what you want or what you think or there's your program or there's your pet project but rather from a collective analysis which is work it's real work to do this you'll find on the uh, on the site examples of uh, sneak organizers coming into a community finding that these this community already had its own organizers and that they are organizing around particular issues and it could be very concrete the price of okra getting laid off of your job on the plantation the sheriff who has arrested, beat up, and participated in lynchings of too many people, what if we could be the sheriff? So very concrete things. And to know about those things and to be able to organize around them starts from an analysis of what's going on. What are people grappling with? What questions are they raising? But there's a lot of work. Yeah. Some of it. Some of it. Not all of it's behind doors. We pretty much opened the door here. And it's composed of interviews, voices. Along the right hand side will be actual documents, not just big state documents, but also, as I said, the jottings of the person who chaired the meeting. Those those kind of we really tried to give an inside look at how the organizing took place. Hey, I have two questions. I'll try to make them quick. Um, and they're coming from the perspective of, um, I, ca I consider myself a public historian, although I'm an academic historian in the university environment. The first question, I'm very interested in, Charlie, what you're sort of talking about, the geographies of the movement and sort of the difference between Virginia and Maryland, say, and Mississippi, as someone located in New Orleans who's familiar with sort of the law, what we consider in New Orleans sort of the very long, early protest tradition that comes out of New Orleans in the 19th century. Um, I'm interested to hear what any of you have to say about the relationship between Mississippi, which is our neighbor, and, and New Orleans, if at all, you know, how it, how it played into um, that period of time as sort of a city, as a space of organizing. Um, you know, I'm thinking of Ann Moody's book, even, where she talks about going from New Orleans you know, to Mississippi. So that's one question. And then my second question to Jerry, um, maybe also to Charlie, is about um, the involvement of teachers. Um, what, what level of involvement did you have with teachers as you're developing um, the website? How did you um, engage with classroom teachers, whether you're talking about, you know, sort of high school, middle school, or college teachers? 
Did you workshop it? Did you bring them into the discussion before our workshop? Um, that sort of thing. Thank you. Let me respond to your first question, <laughs> reluctantly. Um, SNCC's work was largely centered in the rural Black Belt South. It didn't mean that cities didn't exist at all in terms of SNCC's work. Uh, Atlanta, obviously, which is where SNCC was headquartered, uh, there were cities, Selma and Alabama was a city. Uh, and, and SNCC, even before the now famous Selma, two years before the Selma March, SNCC had begun working in Selma, it was essentially its first Alabama project, in fact. Uh, so New Orleans played a different kind of role uh, in terms of, and it, not so much because uh, of the city of New Orleans, but New Orleans in terms of SNCC or Mississippi's mid 20th century struggle uh, uh, was important because it provided a pool of organizers largely coming out of CORE. CORE was very, very strong in New Orleans. So CORE's project director, Dave Dennis, uh, comes, you know, well, he didn't come from New Orleans, but he was deeply involved with the New Orleans CORE chapter. If I ticked off the names that are certainly within the movement, very well known, I mean, perhaps at least close to legendary, Jerome Smith, Rudy Lombard, you know. Luke. Fluki, Mario Suarez, or Fluki. Uh, I mean, there's a whole Arreta, set of, of, of organizers uh, that very specifically came out of the New Orleans core chapter and committed to Mississippi. And I think Dave Dennis had a lot of influence uh, for that happening. Core as a city, I mean, SNCC never had a deep involvement with Louisiana, despite uh, in, in, its, in its very earliest days, uh, Chuck McDude, Dion Diamond uh, wound up in jail, and I, guess, I think that was Baton Rouge for criminal syndicalism, uh, which I won't go into <laughs> what, that, what, what that means, but it was a very ugly period uh, in SNCC's early, early history. Uh, uh, and cities, as I say, uh, uh, were probably less prominent in SNCC's organizing tradition than SNCC's work in the rural uh, Black Belt South. Uh, you know, as somebody who worked in the Mississippi Delta, where the biggest city was had 30,000 people, uh, uh, for us, in some respects, and, and this is more the, the, the human side of, of, of SNCC uh, than the political side of SNCC, uh, cities, uh, Greenville, Mississippi, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, also function as places of R&R. &R. <laughs> yeah, particularly in Mississippi, which was a dry state at that time, you know, it was a relief to go to Memphis <laughs> and have a drink <laughs> and listen to some music. Uh, although alcohol was not difficult to make your way to in Mississippi either. So, but cities had that additional function I mean, Ruleville, where I worked uh, in Sunflower County, had 1,100 people in it. Uh, and, and so uh, cities were, at another level, a welcome relief, as were SNCC conferences in places like Atlanta and Nashville, uh, Tennessee. On the teachers. Uh, let me let me clarify the the editorial board, which is essentially what created the website. On the editorial board, we had archivists, and by this I mean trained archivists, which is different from librarians. So we had archivists, librarians. These are coming from Duke. Uh, we had a few academic historians, who were historians of the movement in particular, and they had to be academic historians of the movement that the activists trusted. And that's not always the same thing. So we got you know, the ones that movement vets said, yes, I saw his book, it's good, he got it. You know, <laughs> I gave him the interview, she understood it. She teaches her own students in a certain kind of way. So we had very few, I, probably three, who were with us all the time. 
Uh, and if you want their names, I can give them. But I think in this context, it's not important. And then the people from the SNCC Legacy Project from the, from the board itself. So that was the working group. The editorial board had that kind of composition. We met all the time. We emailed and digitized. And we had this wonderful project manager who had just completed a PhD herself in civil rights, history of civil rights, or something like that, who meant that, which meant that she understood the context, the content, and she was a great project manager. So that's, that's who actually created this. We hired a web design company, but just totally inverted the relationship. They didn't come up with smart stuff and then show us. We told them what we wanted, why we wanted it, how it was supposed to look. Okay, so first it was done with a pilot. You get a bit of money and you do a pilot. It was called One Person, One Vote, and it's still up. From One Person, One Vote, we use it a lot uh, among a kind of a national teaching community, teachers that we knew about. Let them try to do something with it, and we got feedback. So for example, they weren't all people situated in teaching high schools. One was uh, Maya herself. I don't know if you've already presented your program and the kids, or is that today? But it's a set of high school kids that she worked with uh, th those. She actually was one of the small pilots of One Person, One Vote, because they worked from that. She used it in some kind of teaching way with them. And she told me you know, what happened. And each of us had you know, some kind of relationship with people who were engaged with teaching younger people, and we could get feedback. The larger connection, which I think may interest you, is now that it is done, and almost before it was finished, just before it was finished, and now we have a major set of collaborations with high school teachers all over the country, particularly those who are organized under the umbrella of Teach for Change. I don't know if you've ever heard of Teach for Change. It's in apposition. I won't say opposition, but apposition to Teach for America and the kinds of effects that's had on black urban schools. This is called Teach for Change. Uh, and Judy Richardson, who is not here, but was also from our editorial board, uh, is the person who has the most you know, information on that. But we work, and also the Howard Zinn kind of program of Howard Zinn, uh, that version of what is US history that comes from the Howard Zinn's tradition, the teachers who are clustered around that. And they're doing a lot to, to feed back. During the final year, which was this kind of year, to, for us to finalize it, we were getting feedback from them all the time. And this summer, I don't want to talk too much about it because I may have the details wrong, but this summer, there's a project at Tougaloo, right? No, it's Duke. Last year it was Tougaloo. Last year this year's at Duke at Duke, which is a summer program that we're running specifically with high school teachers who will work with us. Of course, we'll use their feedback. The good thing about doing something digital as opposed to a big heavy book that costs a lot and is out of date is that if we get corrections, if we get new ideas, we can't do a lot, but we can keep this in a kind of an open-ended way. So in brief, we're doing a lot with teachers, but in brief, I would, I would say that. Oh, I'd probably be remiss since this is Brown. When we were doing one person, one vote, or just before that, uh, Charlie Cobb and Judy Richardson were still visiting professors in Africana Studies Department here. Um, and they did interviews with the Choices Program and also Professor Francoise Hamlin, if memory serves. And they created a thing that's about probably Mississippi Freedom Snake. But that also goes out to teachers. And for all those kinds of ancillary and part of the network operations, we have links to them on the site. So you'll see a link to Teach for Change. I think you'll see a link to Choices. This is the value of doing it digitally. You can network in that kind of way. Do we have one more question? OK, cool. We'll do one more and then wrap up, I think. Um, I just want to thank you for speaking today. Um, so my name is Rachel Campbell. Um, I attend Roger Williams University, and I'm a sophomore. I'm also a student activist um, in the Peace Program, which is just we teach about critical social justice and the history behind that to the incoming freshman class. So I currently work alongside the Chief Diversity Officer and um, Dr. Aaron Allen at my school, along with other peers. And we've created a black living learning community that reaches out to the freshmen incoming black students to help foster a community that reaches out to them so that they can know their identity and help like form that so that they don't lose it along the way in their college um like when living on campus um but currently we struggle with reaching out to black men and i wanted to know what do you guys suggest going about us um creating an organic and sustainable community that reaches out to the black men 
to just black men? Um, <laughs> currently, because the black women that we have on campus and even like students of color that are women, we like they're always on the front for like they put their first foot forward but the black men um are always like they'll say that oh we will show up but then when it's time to put the work in they don't show up because (laughs) i feel as if not i don't i'm not trying to say it's an old problem i understand (laughs) (laughs) but for men on on roger williams campus it's easier for them to assimilate onto this campus than it is for black women Uh Well, I will, uh, from our perspective, um, again, the way the NAACP work, people are elected uh, to office. And, but you gotta be, again, intentionally, and most of the time, if you give people something, something to do, something that's quality, you know, that they can, you know, uh, put their teeth into, that you, you can attract people that way. And I understand what you're saying about um, males because uh, we experienced some of the same thing with, uh, it's primarily in the younger generation where I have a younger brother saying, well, you know, I don't have time for that. But you, you got to be intentionally inclusive, including them. And, and the other thing is just, just don't give up, <laughs> you know. Uh, they will come around, it, but you've got to give them something, maybe not the president, but give them something substantial to do that they can see that's, you know, they, you can kind of meet them where they are and that they will be able to do something that's rewarding to them. Yeah, um, as, as we all say, it's not a surprise. Women have done a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, one of the things that Stokely Carmichael used to do when we were at Howard, in terms of trying to get people to go on demonstrations. He would say, look, we're gonna do this demonstration, but after the demonstration, we're gonna have a great party. So people who wanted to get to the party would go to the demonstration. (laughs) Seems to me that you might wanna figure out you know, beside the work that you want to get them to do, what are the other things that they're interested in that you can begin to weave in to the discussion? Um, But under no circumstances stop what you're doing to try to get them done. You just keep what you're doing. And at some point, which is, I think, also Charlie's point, is, I mean, there are two things. Keep what you're doing. Figure out how to challenge, which is the thing, or also figure out how to get them involved in some kind of social situation that they feel then they they then they you can also challenge them to to do what was supposed to be done. Yeah. But I mean, but keep doing what you're doing, whatever that is, to keep with doing what you're doing. If I, I in I live in Florida, uh, and the Dream Defenders. Uh, are, are very active as, as, as one of the groups in the movement for black lives. And they have monthly social gatherings, uh, which are mostly social, but it, it's clear in, in uh, uh, letting the word go out that within the context of gathering at the, this place, people are gonna be asked to do something. For instance, right now, uh, they are uh, campaigning around the issue of gaining the right to vote for convicted felons who have served their time. And so there's a lot of need for uh, uh, bodies, if you will, just to get petitions signed to be in various places where people gather. And part of what those, and, and if you come to those social gatherings, quote, uh, you are going to be asked if, if you will, uh, you know, help uh, with that. The main thing, what I learned in the South was persistence counts for a lot. And that I learned that, that people respond to different things for different reasons. So the person, and here it's not so much males or young people, it's just that I learned that 
that uh, uh, a person who might not be interested in doing this might be interested in doing that, and sometimes it takes you a while to find out what will uh, get a person uh, engaged. And the only way, which is why I never got, why, why it took me almost five years to get out of Mississippi, uh, <laughs> persistence I, I just counts for a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys again so much. Um, so that concludes our first panel for the day.